Then, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to. Whoops, my chair just dropped. <laughs> um, it's not technical difficulties. It's uh, physical difficulties here. Um, welcome to our webinar chat, um, which is being sponsored by the Small Firms Committee and the Residential Design Committee. And today we have Melissa Lind. She's a social media marketing guru uh, from Taos, New Mexico. And uh, she's going to be leading us through a presentation of how we can improve our presence um, visually as well as just physically <laughs> uh, through social media. Um, we, I'd like to please uh, welcome as, as well, uh, Ellen Perko is here, she's my co-chair. And um, Kristen and Christina, do you want to have a shout out to your small firms committee? Sure. Um, I'm Kristen Genitasio. For those of you who don't know me, I'm co chair of the Small Practices Network with Christina Marsh. She's waving. Um, we meet uh, monthly on the third Thursday from noon to 1 30, and we cover topics that are relevant to small practices, which we um, define as uh, firms that have a, a less than 15 people, give or take, but we are open to all. Great. Welcome. This is our first time with a combined uh, presentation, and uh, we're excited because there are so many topics that uh, overlap between our committees. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Melissa for an introduction. We'll get started. And then just in terms of uh, questions, if you would put them into the chat for the time being, so um, Melissa can get through her presentation. And if I see something in the chat that's very, very pertinent, I might interrupt, but otherwise we'll have a Q&A session at the end. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to Melissa. All right, I'll share my screen and get started. Okay. So first off, I, I'd like to know what specialties you guys have. Uh, so if you would mind, wouldn't mind typing in the chat just what your specialties are, that'd be nice to know. And um, I've got some other things I'd like you to participate in in the chat that I'll mention as we go along. So the, the topic of the discussion is marketing that educates and inspires. So I'll tell you a little bit about this photograph. This is my son who's a four-year-old and um, I do a lot of um, architectural photography and this is a client of mine that works in the Taos Ski Valley and his specialty is prefabricated luxury homes up in the Ski Valley. There's a very small window of time to, to build up in that area. So the prefabricated model works great for him. So it's his specialty. And his market are oftentimes young families who are very active. So they like to ski and they come here for the weekends. And, and the, the thing to brag about about your house in this area is um, how many people you can sleep. <laughs> so it's often, all about the bunk bed rooms. <laughs> and so, um, so the bunk bed experience for the kids is, is, has to be right on. So I just photographed three of his homes and they all have these bank of bunk beds, four to a room. And then one of the houses has two of those. So it has eight of these bunk rooms. And so we're doing marketing for him that is messaging for these kind of families who are looking for an experience for their kids that is joyous and fabulous and they'd be running around the house and they they ski they're very active it's, there's mountain biking hiking all kinds of activities and this is their chance to get away from whatever it is they're doing in their in their busy worlds and they bring their family with the, the cat and the dog and the lizards and they all come here and they just have a blast and so how do you capture that moment? Because we're trying to make an emotional connection with your prospective clients based on who they are and what kind of life transformation they're looking for next. And so um, I took some, you know, regular architectural photos of just these very pretty rooms in the kitchen and the bathroom and, you know, all that. And then I had my son and my husband meet me for lunch. And then I just followed him around as he investigated this amazing house. And he 
you know, to have a four-year-old leading you through a house is such a fabulous experience because, you know, everything is is amazing for them and so like this picture of him he just like laid himself out in the bed and he was like this is amazing mom <laughs> and so that's what his clients are looking for for their kids is this experience where they can get away from the work week and just like be inspired by nature and and being with friends and family so I'll, I'll i have more pictures of this project that i'll show you later but i just wanted to give you an introduction of like that's, that's the theme of what I do for my business and, and what we're talking about here, because we want your clients to be well-educated about what you do so that you're not spending a lot of time trying to convince them that, that they're right for you. They can go on your website and they find all this information and they just know that you're right for them because they've, they've been pre-qualified through all the education that you gave them. And then these little moments or these these photographs that show what it's like for them because we're really the your clients are the hero of their story and you're the guide so we want to create craft and experience for them that that you know they're they're the movie star of this show and how can we guide them through it uh, so a little bit about me my company is dwelling creative and it's a creative market agency specifically for builders architects and designers and so my background is uh, landscape architecture. I studied at Arizona State, and then I practiced in California and Colorado for about 10 years. And um, I'm LEED certified and uh, worked for various firms, mostly in high-end residential work, and really loved it. And I was finding myself in the firms that I was working with doing a lot of marketing work and loved that even more. And so my husband and I decided to move to Northern New Mexico in Taos, and we, um, it, it allowed me to make a switch into marketing. And so I started with one of my clients was a peer. She's a landscape architect who does um, rooftop gardens in Manhattan. So I did her website and I just was like, I love that connection to it. So I made the switch into marketing and I've been doing that for about a decade and really specialized in architects and builders because that's where my background is and that's what I love to like work with these beautiful photographs. Um, my great grandfather was a landscape architect. He worked for the Olmsted brothers in Greenwich, Connecticut. And I've lived all over the place, um, but now we live in Northern New Mexico, which is, this is it. This is, this is what we love. And um, this is the house we're moving into next week. So next time I do a presentation, they'll have some landscaping in it. <laughs> um, so, an overview of what we're going to be talking about before I ever I used to when I first started out, I would do a website for a client and then I'd hand it off to them and then they would be like, and now what <laughs> like, now what do I do with this? And I'd be like, well, you know, do your business. And so it kept pushing me to, to figure out more about how marketing works. It's not just a website. It used to be you could have a website and people would get traffic to it organically because but now that everyone has a website, you need something that drives traffic to it. So then I started getting into social media and then, you know, more and more and more until I'm figuring out this like whole picture. And I realized that you need to know why you're doing business before you create any of that. You know, you need to understand what your values are, what you're trying to accomplish. Otherwise, putting together that marketing isn't hitting its target. So that's the first part of this is, is why we're doing this. What are the values? Who are your ideal clients? And then we get into the marketing. And I wanted to spell just right off what marketing is because specifically architects and builders, they, they think of marketing as kind of yucky or salesy or advertising or it's expensive. And they're like, oh, I don't want to get into that. So just straight off, marketing is not advertising. That's a part of it. But marketing is connecting with ideal clients. And if you start to think about it like that, how um, if you break it down to like somebody, a service professional that you found, like a hairstylist or a mechanic who you just like, I finally found that perfect person to take care of the thing that I need. You really value that. And if they leave, it's like devastating because now you have to find a new hairstylist, you know, when, and you had a relationship with them. So if you think about it like that, people are looking for you. And when they find you, they are ecstatic because your values match, you are the person they're looking for. And so 
to give to make the information that they're looking for easier to find you that's really the key so you're just we're making opportunities for connection and how to automate that on your website so that it's an it's a lead machine you can set it up and then there is some ongoing stuff but you set up the the main part of it and let it do its automatic thing and then number three is accountability and this is really big um i Architects are always in a rush and busy and there's so much to do. And, uh, but I mean, what, it's, what is at stake here is the kind of lifestyle that you want your business to provide for you. And so if you don't take time to connect with those ideal clients, you could be working with clients just haphazardly for an entire career rather than sitting down and taking the time and mapping it out saying, okay, I'm here, but this is where I wanna be. So that's what is, what's at stake. So, so having some kind of accountability in place to make sure you get there is important. So um, if you can find a partner, maybe in this group of somebody, maybe pick one person who say, okay, we'll be accountability partners and we'll go through the information that Melissa gave us and we're gonna meet once a week or once a month and make sure that we did it. And it doesn't even have to be like, hey, what do you think of this work? It can be just like, did you do it? <laughs> Schedule the time and then I'll give you some resources to get forward on it. All right, so number one, why? Why are we in this business at all? There was a moment for all of you that, that happened that was like, yes, I wanna be an architect. So it's important to remember why, because when you get in your business, you, you're jumping from thing to thing and project to project and there are challenges and problems and you can be starting to think, why am I doing this? <laughs> you know, it's easy to forget. Even when you're in school, you know, it's still a bubble. It's still this like theory of philosophy of improving lives. And it's, it's easy to forget that when you get into the daily, day, daily grind of, of what this is. So why did you get in this business in the first place? Was it a moment? Was it a person? And if you could type that one word in the chat, that would be great to see. Okay, uh, so for me, um, it was Hearst Castle in California. We, my family took a trip to California uh, when I was, I think, 10 years old and I had my first camera. Um, just, um, I think I had black and white film even maybe some color, but we went to California and I had grown up in Colorado, which is high desert, very dry. And this was just like such a wonderland to me. We went to Carmel, we went to Hearst Castle and I was like, that's it, I'm moving to California <laughs> and I'm gonna be a landscape architect. And I took all these photographs of just plants and beautiful landscapes. And I had made sure there weren't any people in them <laughs> because I wanted just these pristine landscapes. And when I walked into this room of Hearst Castle and saw this, I was just stunned. And I think back to that moment because it, ma it makes me feel a certain way that I, that I really cherish. So what is it for you that made you become an architect? So now that vision has changed a little bit and it's gonna be the same with your business. You're gonna, your tastes are gonna change, it's gonna evolve. So now this is the photograph that I have pinned on the wall behind me. And this is what keeps me going. And, and the, the vision that I have beyond this is, you know, the family that fills this, the gatherings that I'll have here, the lifestyle that it's going to provide for me. So start to imagine, you know, what, what the why is for you, because people, not only for yourself, but your clients, because people buy why you do the work you do, not what it is. Okay, and then why an entrepreneur? That's an entirely different thing. It's like one thing to become an architect, but then you're like, oh, also I'm gonna be a small business owner. And likely not most of you decided you wanna be an architect because you wanted your own business. Likely um, it was because you wanted this feeling of like, yes. When you first had the idea, you were like, oh, that's gonna be amazing. So write in the chat again, the one word that was the thing that that made you get there. And for me, it was freedom. I wanted the freedom to choose my own clients. I wanted the freedom to possibly make more money. I didn't know if that was possible, but I was interested in that. Um, and then I also wanted just this like feeling of freedom and joy. So um, so most people that I've talked to, talk to, they are looking for higher quality clients more freedom and more profit. And so all the work that I've done over the last decade in my marketing has, and I've tried and tested everything, 
And I've distilled it down to the things that I think have the best return on investment for architects for the kind of time that you're willing to or able to put into it and, and the resources that you have. Okay, so number one, uh, master plan your business. So you wouldn't recommend building a house without plans, obviously, that's what you do. So why would you build a business without a plan? So we're looking at where you are now, and then we're creating a picture of where you want to be, and then we need to connect the dots for that. So the first one absolutely has to be personal values, because if you're not matching your personal values with your business values and your clients, then that's a mismatch. You don't want to end up with clients that you don't have common values with, because that's just hard. You know, you've all had that client that was just like hard. <laughs> and you don't want to recreate that. So keep that in mind. Keep it to heart. When you have that next client come, he's like, oh, I don't think they're a very good fit for me for this, this, and this reason. Say, okay, if I say no to them, it makes room for the clients that I really want. So for me, my personal values are insp inspired growth, travel and this joyous family time. So as you put together your business master plan, this is your foundation, your personal values, and then your business values. And a, a great exercise for you to use is, uh, and I learned this from a business coach, is to take all of your clients and grade them from A to F, and then take all your A clients and analyze what it is about them that you appreciated the most. And for me, it was really good communication. Um, that they were timely in their payments and requests for things that I needed from them. And that they're just like, yeah, like Matthew McConaughey, like fun to be around, you know, like intelligent, smart, driven, uh, just like joyous. And I think selecting a celebrity is a fun way to do it because when you're teaching your team about who it is you're trying to attract and talking to it to other people, you can immediately say, okay, Matthew McConaughey, how do they rank with him? And I really, I seriously do have several clients that are like him, so it works. Okay, um, so, so once you've got this information, then you can start putting together the avatar for your ideal client. So this is an example of a, a client in Park City. He's a builder and he does, their, almost all second homes um, that are, you know, five to $10 million homes. And so we looked at their values. So specifically for this area, they are very active, you know, the same as, as my area. They're skiers, mountain bikers, they love toys. So they've got like a garage that's full of Teslas and kayaks and boats, and they've got a recreational vehicle and a sports mobile. And, and, but then they are also into the, the art scene, they like the historic downtown, and they're also philanthropic. They're often on boards of, of organizations and they're CEOs of big companies. So they do have money to like to, to give out. And that's um, a very specific, it's not just, okay, they have a lot of money. They also have these really specific ideas. And then when you start to look at your marketing, you can know where your people are hanging out and that's where you find them to connect with them. So put together a little, you know, a vignette of what kind of brands they're looking at, what kind of family demographics do they have, and then a, a description of them. Uh, here's another one of uh, my Manhattan Beach client. This is a design build firm. And similarly, um, we chose Gwyneth Paltrow because she would be a great spokesperson for them. And people are same kind of homes. It's like two to five million but they are different in that they're looking for that culture of that city because it's casual, but it's also elegant. And you can find five-star restaurants there, but you can go there in flip-flops. So it's a different vibe than, than other places that are just you know big money. And it's a lot about family, young families and being at the beach. Um, then again, what are your ideal projects? And it's not to say that you can't take on projects that aren't your ideal, but um, so if we, we take, for example, my, my builder in the ski valley, he, he is beginning to be known as the guy who can do contemporary modern homes in the ski valley, and specifically these sustainable 
prefabricated homes. So that's kind of a niche that he's created, but he has been doing those for, I don't know, three to five years now. And he's getting a little tired of it because it's very detailed work and modern work is, is very precise. And he said, you know, I, I like being known for that, but it's easier to build the Adobe homes in home because they don't have to be so perfect. You know, it's more about these organic lines and I kind of need a break. If I niche into this small specific area, will I still be able to do that work? And I absolutely, yes. The difference is that in our town, there are 50 builders who do these Adobe homes. And so to try to compete with that is not as easy as competing with a niche that's like this ski valley area that he can he can nationally be known for that and locally. So even though some of the projects may not line up in a specific niche to try to to identify what that is initially is always a good idea. So what a niche is is pairing your talent with your market. Um, it could be the style, billing type, your values, your interests, a demographic, um, modern, Victorian, lake house, glass, steel. And if you guys could enter in the chat what you think um, your niche is, or if you're still working that out, that'd be good information. Uh, so current market. So it's one thing to say, oh, I wanna do this, but are people actually looking for that? So one way to figure that out is uh, what do they have in common? your A to F clients, your A clients mostly, and what are they struggling with? So what are they often telling you that they are having problems with? What keeps them up at night? So that tells you that there's a market for it. And then this is a really cool tool that you can use. It's trends.google.com. And you can enter in a key term. So I entered in Boston architect, and it says for the week from December 15th through the 21st, there were a hundred searches for that specific term. And so you can add in, you know, multiple terms, and then it will tell you what related searches are, what people are actually searching for. Now, if you put in architect, it's not going to have a lot of um, hits because people are actually looking for more information than just architect. They don't want to just know what an architect is. People already know that. They want a descriptor with that key term. So this can help you to decide if there's a market in your niche and how to use those keywords on your website because you may say that it is maybe it's eco lux that you're looking for and you type that in and there aren't any searches for it so what that means is um, people aren't using that exact phrase so you might try something like sustainable luxury or green luxury or eco luxury so trying out these different terms then you'll get to know what people are actually searching for rather than a term that has been in your industry and is just jargon that people don't really understand. Uh, this is a phenomenal book, Vivid Vision. It's two and a half hours. You can get it on Audible for five bucks. Um, I, if you have any trouble sleeping, I usually get up at, I wake up at four o'clock and then I read and I listen to an Audible book for a couple hours. So if, if any of you have that situation, <laughs> then this is a great quick read. And this will help you put together that master plan and the vision and a, a good structure of how to do it. So um, what we're trying to do here is to, to, to find a niche for you and then to position yourself as the best person to do that. And you can do that nationally nowadays. It used to be, you know, your only resource to find people was a phone book, but now, and I know technology is a lot and it can be overwhelming. But the beauty of it is that it's opened it up to the world so that you can really be nationally known for a very small thing. Just like me, I'm doing marketing in a tiny little town of 5,000 people and I could live anywhere now. And that is certainly possible for architects because you don't need to be in that location. So think about the, the idea of expanding globally so you could you know, live anywhere if that's part of your value system. If it's not, then no, but still know that you can be nationally recognized for a niche. So why be the best in that niche? There's a mathematical law called Zipp's law. It's a statistic that positioning yourself as number one results in 10 times the return on investment, on investment as being number 10. So you can see how, how, that return on investment 
um, is so powerful. Seth Godin's a really excellent writer on marketing if you're interested in getting more information. And the, he, this quote I love, it's almost impossible to overinvest in becoming the market leader. All right, next slide. All right, so again, marketing is connecting. I like to think of it as a farmer's market, you know? It's like when you think about that day or that time that you need to spend um, getting your marketing together, instead of thinking advertising or like yuck or sales, think about, okay, I just need to go to the farmer's market today <laughs> and get my prospective clients lined out. All right, so this is the custom home journey. And this kind of gives you a picture of where people find you and what their process is to finally make a call with you and sign a contract. So how your ideal clients find you is here. This is their research phase and generally how they go through your material, engagement, and then contact. So under how they find you, it could be referrals, it could be direct mail, it could be Google, it could be social media. And referrals are always going to be golden, like the best kind of advertising or the best kind of marketing that you can do. So keep that in mind that that, that, connect, that human connection is always going to be number one. And then the rest of the marketing that you do is really to bolster that, those relationships. So after they find you, they go into a research phase. And oftentimes the first thing they'll do is look at your website before they contact you for sure. This is very much like a relationship, <laughs> you know, dating online. If you're going on a date with someone, you'll likely Google them, see if they're on Facebook, see what people have to say about them, how they engage with other people. So they're gonna look at your website, your homepage, and then they'll often go to your portfolio first and then they'll go to your about page. Now, um, after that, they'll look at the quality of your testimonials because what other people have to say about you is often more important for someone who doesn't know you than what you have to say about yourself. And that's the same with Google. They feel the same way. So if you've got testimonials on Google, they say, oh, okay, then this is legitimate rather than just you saying, ah, I'm the best. Uh, then social proof. So they may, people have got their favorite social things. So um, for, for architects, Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, LinkedIn. So, and not to say that you need to be completely active on all of those, but to have some kind of pre presence on one of the, or on all of those is a great idea. And then maybe to focus on one of those is great because people have their favorites. You know, some people are into Twitter, some people are into LinkedIn. It's not often that they're engaged in all of them, but you do want to have a basis for them to be like, oh, they are on my favorite platform. And so I'm going to go check out what they've got there. And so what's cool about social media is that they can engage with your content. Whereas, you know, with a magazine article, there's no way for them to leave a comment or say, you know, hey, that's a great photograph. So now with social media, they can leave a comment on your photograph and then you start and you start to know what is popular with your fan club. Uh, my, I do some magazine ads with, with my clients and we often will look at our Instagram feed and see what which photograph was the most popular based on what people liked on social media. And it's oftentimes different than we thought it would be. So people can kind of investigate how you engage with other people on social media and what your tone is, if you're upbeat or if you're serious or what you're involved in. And you can tell them um, the, you know, the community activities you're part of and, and they get to know what your worldview is. And if your worldview is similar to those, then they're getting sold on you because the biggest factor in getting your client to sign a contract is trust. And you guys know this, you get involved in their personal life a lot more than you'd like to. You start to know about what their marriage status is, how their kids are doing, because this is all about lifestyle. They're hoping that working with you is going to improve their life. And so they have to divulge some secrets to you that they're hoping you won't tell anybody, <laughs> you know, it's like hiring a counselor. Um, so they really have to trust you. And so the warm up period for them to get from here to here is pretty long. You know, it could be six months, it could be years and years. And so this is where you want to get your client interested. You don't want to do advertising that's like, hey, hire me, I'm great. That's over here, because that's like asking someone to marry them on the first date. We're trying to warm them up here. And so the what I've put together for you guys is about education and inspiration. 
So then they go to, they see all this and they say, okay, I'm in. This person sounds like I'd get along with them. I'd go to, we'd invite them over for dinner. I'm going to opt into their email series. You know, they're, they've got like a little guide or something. I'm going to give them my email address. I'm going to trust them with that, which is, it used to be easier. It's not as easy now. And then they get into what the education that you have to provide. So maybe they get an email once a month from you. Um, and then you can track to see whether or not they open that email. And maybe you have some kind of call to action on the end of the newsletter to go to your website, to check out an educational article. And then you say, hey, if you have any questions, give me a call. And so you start to see how interested they are. And then all of the information that you've got on your website, on your marketing, all the messaging is designed specifically for them. So it's like, it's like you were reading their minds. They see that article and they're like, wow, that's exactly what I'm looking for. How did they even know? It's because you were very specific about the information and the photographs that you put together. So you're speaking very directly to one group of people instead of watering down a message that goes to everyone and doesn't really speak directly to anyone. And when you do that, you pre-qualify them so that when they are ready to, to design that house, they are, they've read your articles, they know who you are, and then it's a slam dunk because they're like, oh yeah, I was, they may have decided to hire you, you know, three months before and they're trying to get their financing together. And then when you have that phone call with them, it's a slam dunk because they, uh, you were referred from another client. They checked out your website. Your testimonials were in line. They look, your photos looked great. All of that stuff is in line. And then you get here, it's a slam dunk. So let's go into some of the information about how to do that. Okay, inbound content marketing is, this is such a magical thing. And it's it's a new a new type of marketing that was not available before we had the technology that we have now. It used to be the only way you could get advertisements was completely one-sided on the television, on the newspaper, in magazines, was like, hey, buy our stuff, here it is. And, but there's no way for that person to engage with them and they couldn't even choose. You know, It's like you watch a show and you get this commercial, you have no choice in the matter. And so it's kind of just like guessing whether or not that's the information you want. So now with Google, you've got the entire web and they are looking to give results that are the best fit for the answer that they're looking for. And so they scour the web and that advertising means that the, you put the education out there and then the, the leads are coming to you. So that's what it means by inbound. So you're creating educational content that's interesting and relevant to them. And then they come to you instead of you going out to them, which is kind of what Facebook advertising is interruptive marketing. Blogging is inbound content marketing and content meaning that's information that they're looking for that's educating them. So blogging, email marketing, newsletter, social media is content marketing. Interruptive marketing is things like Facebook advertisements, magazines, billboards, which is, there is certainly a place for this, but it's not in the beginning. This educational part needs to be first. So how to blog. Uh, this is my, the distilled version of how to blog and we're, we'll go into the details of it, but make a list of 12 topics for the year, pick one day a month to do it, Write and revise the blog, about three hours. Post to your website and social media, around four hours. And put together a newsletter, one hour. So that's if, this is that one day a month. If you had to spend it doing anything, this is what I would suggest based on 10 years of experience working with different clients. This is how your energy is best spent because it's based on education, getting your client to know who you are and what you do. So educate your market. Why do that? The most famous architects in history were always educators. They wrote books, they taught in universities, and that's no accident. They were the best in what they did. And so, of course, people are asking them to be in these positions. But now your website can be your university. So every little article that you write is a, a mini course on what it is that you're doing. So blogging and newsletter, like how, what are the results based on that? The results for your client are, you are giving them ed education. That 
puts you as the expert. You're solving their problem. That makes you an authority. They get to know you. They get to trust you. Results online, this is like the beauty of it. I mean, blogging is really number one to educate your client, but number two, you get results online because Google rewards you with high ranking because of these expert authority and trust factors. That's what their Google is also looking for. So you gain organic traffic from blogging forever. You put up an article once, it continues to get traffic for the life of your website. Whereas if you pay for any kind of advertising, you pay for that advertising. And then as soon as that payment is up, it's done. So that's what makes it the best return on investment. Results for your business and life, higher quality clients, more profit, more freedom. So Google likes, this is the acronym they use is EAT, which is expert authority and trust. So these are three things that you need to get squared away for your business if you don't have them already right now. Um, put together your Google My Business profile, get Google Analytics on your website, and then get testimonials on Google. So this is what it looks like over here. Um, if you so if, if you put in a, a search for any business, or maybe say, so this is White Sands Design Build My Client in Manhattan Beach. So if somebody searched for Design Build Manhattan Beach, California, then a list of people will come up. And then on the right hand side of that search, this comes up and it shows you before they even tap on a link, how many reviews they have. So this says they have five, uh, they have 13 five-star reviews. And if you want to have your people give you reviews, all you have to do is um, select, if you click on reviews here, it'll pull up this, it'll show you each one of those reviews. And then there's a section that says give a review. So that's an actual link and you can send that to people. And I have a, a document at the end that will lead you through some of this technical stuff and how to get it done. Okay, um, so Google Analytics. So actually looking at what blogging does for your site. So these are, these are different clients that we analyze the data for. So this is five different clients and how long that it took for those to start getting leads and then the average traffic increase. So the downside on blogging is that Google doesn't start to recognize and give you traffic for a while. So it can be three months to six months before you'll start getting traffic from a, a blog post. But then once it does, it never stops unless that, that topic starts to become irrelevant. And so even if you're not exactly sure what you wanted to blog about, um, I would say start doing it now and you can always go back and revise that stuff because once that link is made, Google says, okay, they've got a blog post that was made on this date. Six months from now, it's still there. They're still in business. They're still running stuff. They're still relevant. And they've been doing consistent blog posting over this time. Now we're gonna start giving them, uh, rewarding them for that consistency. You can revise that article with that same link and, and Google will give you an instant boost on that because you're making the content even better. So the average traffic increase is 81% after one month if you revise a post that's been on your site for more than 90 days. So that's why important it's important to just get it up now even if it's not perfect. Then you can always go back and revise. So here's a graph that shows you kind of what the investment is. So putting together a blog post, and this is if you were doing it yourself, is a little bit higher than if you were paying for Google ads or Facebook ads. But uh, Facebook ads, if you're hiring somebody else to do it, and it's, it's kind of pricey, um, and paying for the ad revenue can cost about two grand a month. So, and Google is also pretty expensive. But again, that stays steady. You have to pay for that advertisement every time, whereas the amount that it costs for that blog post drops to almost nothing after month six based on, on clicks. All right, so how do we get that email address? How do we get that first connection with your client happening? This is called the lead magnet. And this is the first piece of educational content that is going to lead your client into the funnel. So you, if you make that list of 12 blog posts that you think are interesting, take that, the one that is the thing you get the most questions about that is specific to your niche, 
that you can get results of, about it and put together some kind of document or brochure that people can download in exchange for an email address. And this should be on your homepage. So this is an example of a, a quiz um, that is a company called Interact that you can look up and they have them already templated out. Um, so what kind of house should you build? So you can put photographs of your projects in there and they go through the quiz and they just select, I like that house, I like this bedroom, I like that bathroom. And at the end they say, based on your selections, you're this kind of person. And it's kind of a fun way to do it, but it could be any of these things. It could be a checklist, a quiz, a planner. So this whole list here is things that is proven to sh that get more clicks using this terminology. So if you wanna take a screenshot of this, so you remember like how to, to put this together. It can be around five pages with photos and interesting text, something that they can read through right away. You don't want it something that's like so huge that they're like, oh, I'll get to that later. You want them to download it and read it right away. Once you've got their email list, then, you, then they're in your system and you can continue to educate them. So this is like, this is like the entrance into your university. This is the exam they need to take. So what we're trying to do is, is set your website up as a lead machine. So on your homepage, and I'll go into some details of this later, um, we want some kind of hero image that, that, that tells your client that they're the hero of this story and you are the guide. We want to identify their problem, some kind of tagline, give them a solution, which is your lead magnet. Uh, here's a couple websites that I redid and I'll show you what we did. So this is the before, which is, you know, it's okay. They're a builder, maybe, what do they do? So it says White Sands, Develop Interiors, Acquire, Build, Design is kind of like, I'm not sure what that means. looks like maybe it's on the ocean, but it doesn't give you a lot of information. So this is how we reworked it. Uh, number one, we were looking for that hero image. So this is the woman who wants to be living in Manhattan Beach. She's got a busy life in New York. Um, she works all the time, she works very hard and she needs to get away to like this beach place where almost every, all year round, you can go to the beach and the weather is great. And then she wants to go back to this house where it's got this huge door you open up and it just, you can see the entire ocean. And so the living room is part of the deck and you've got this instant connection with nature. And then this kitchen, which is just like, you know, it's got that vibe of relaxation and casual and hippiness. And even though her house in New York is like this really business, very structured house, she wants to get here and live here. And, and this is her husband who really, the only thing he wants to do is feel his feet in the sand and he's fine with whatever else. <laughs> so that's the hero. Um, what, and what they're looking for is they want something that somebody just totally takes care of it for him. They hire them. It's turnkey. It's, custom homes for Southern California beach living. Southern California, because we want to be there all year round. It's foundation to furniture, which means I can just hire them and they're going to take care of everything. I can just sit back. And then I'm like, yes, I'm interested. How do I opt in? Get started with our beach house journal, the process of building yours from A to Z. And I'm like, yes, please click. All right, here's another example. So this is the Park City Builder. Um, so we put together, and this, they don't always need to be a montage of folder or photographs, but sometimes it's, it's really tricky to find one photograph that, that shows all of that. So we put together this montage of, of a skier because, you know, they're oftentimes, you know, they want the best equipment. They want the latest of this. They want the best technology. Um, even if they're not great skiers, they want, they, they want the best of the best. And then they want this like huge sky. They get there and they live in some big city where you just can't see the stars. And so like, that's important for them to go outside and just like have the Milky Way dripping over you. And then this is like the command center. It's got the garage with all the toys and instantly I can be out there doing this and that. And I want it to be the best and I want it to be like technologically on point. And we've got this, the map of kind of the area, the top, the topography, which kind of speaks to, you know, it's rugged and we can go hiking and we're going to do all these backpacking type stuffs. And then the, the text is custom homes and re renovations for custom living, because these people are often from tech companies and they're like, they want the custom house for their custom lifestyle. 
And so that's what matches it. So this is what Park City designers suit you best. Take our quiz and then we start here. Um, this is one that I didn't design, but I, I just found it. This is the gal who built that house that is, is the picture that is behind my wall. Um, so this picture I love because it doesn't show a piece of architecture, but it shows like what the possibility is. If you show one house, it's possible that they're like, oh, you know, that's not my style. So they're not really talking to me. So you're, you're talking again about putting them up as the hero. So this is a chair on the edge of this like vastness. So you know that she works in these like big expanses and then it's this extended deck with a seat that's just for me. And what's behind me, of course, is my dream house and what it is that's back there. I can totally envision what that life is looking like. And you're not telling me what it is because I want to be part of this process. I want the architect to know that I am giving you the vision and I'm hoping, hoping, hoping you can make it even better than what I thought it was gonna be. Um, just a quick tip on contact to pre-qualify your leads, have them ask some questions more than just filling in their information. Have they purchased a lot? Do you, uh, this is for a builder, how, do you have an architect or designer? So you may wanna ask, do you have a builder? What is your time frame, and what is your general budget? So immediately this, this builder says, I'm not gonna build anything below a million. So if they go here and they say, oh, well, there's not like a place for me to put my $500,000 home, then, then immediately he's not qualified. And so that saves the builder time in going, oh, I'm sorry, I can't build it. You seem like really nice people. I would love to, maybe I could just meet with you. And then you've got like three hours that you spent that was not, not fruitful. Portfolio, um, only put in projects that you wanna be doing in the future. If there's something that's on your website that you did and you were like, ah, eh, it's work that I've done and maybe somebody will be interested in that, but I don't necessarily wanna do it in the future, but I want people to be able to reference it, take that off of your website. You don't wanna be advertising for work that you don't wanna be doing. Um, portfolio management, a way to just make it easy. Uh, as soon as you get photographs of your house, you want to title the images for SEO, which means including your name, your area, your niche, upload it to your website, house, Google My Business, and later.com, which is for social media. You do this all at the same time and you can done it, get it done really quickly. If you do it just for your website and then a week goes by and you put it up here and here and there, that's eaten up eight hours. Whereas if you do it this way, it can be done in a couple hours. Okay, photography. So uh, architects usually have beautiful photographs of the houses that's already taken care of. So what I'd like you to add are some process phot photography about the people you're working with so that they get to know who you are on a personal level. Again, we're looking for them to trust you. Are you a family person? Are you a professional? What kind of activities do you like? We want them to get to know you and your team so that by the time they get to you and are ready to hire, they already know all that stuff. You don't have to introduce them because they've been watching your news feed on Instagram for the last year. Um, architectural photos, um, just one small note. I think having photographs that have light in them is always is the difference between, say you take this, this picture and it's at a certain time of day where it doesn't show the light kind of cascading over the materials is gonna be a far different picture than this because it shows texture, it shows movement. And if you can have some people in there, I think that's great too. Um, lifestyle photographs. So this is where that inspiration comes in. and. Um, also scale to see how people are actually living. I mean, the reason we got into architecture is because of how it's going to transform a life in a space. And so just to show pictures that are just these perfect houses is leaving out most of the story. We're really talking about how it is that people live in here, how they interact with their family. Uh, so here's a social media feed for the Manhattan Beach clients. And I like to have two or three photographs of people in them in every cluster because of that same thing. We wanna make it personal. And you can batch all of these. This is later.com is a, a tool you can use where you can take one photograph, you put it up and then it splits it out into Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, and Twitter. All right, so storytelling photography. Uh, this is the house that 
uh, is up in the ski valley and where I followed my four-year-old around. So I want to show you. So this is the picture without the person in it. And this is the picture with him in it. Like it just adds, you know, that much more of like, this is a house where kids run around and get crazy in. Um, so this is the hallway. And then this is the little guy like running down the hall. And this is basically all he did was just like run around the house the entire time. And, you know, they've got a game table and like up and down the stairs to go hiking across the creek and playing with the puzzle. And he was like, whoa, did you see this tree outside this window? And look at these puppets. Can you imagine what's blah, 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 blah. It's like, did you know you can get up here and turn on all these lights? And then him and his dad took a hike and I was like, yes, this is what custom living in the mountains feels like. So here's an idea for you guys. At the end of a project, um, as a way to celebrate having finished it with a client, ask them if you can have like a little cheese and wine party where you go over to the house and you have a photographer over as well. And maybe they can do their actual architectural photography on that same day so that you can set it all up and it's all beautiful. So maybe the photographer does those first and then you have a little gathering where you can, the photographer can just follow you around. So this is an interior designer client of mine in town and she remodeled this Adobe home. And so that's exactly what we did. We invited two or three uh, people over. We had some wine and cheese and you can hire a wedding photographer to do this for much cheaper than you can hire an architectural photographer because they don't use, for this kind of photography, you don't need a tripod or a tilt shift lens, which are very expensive. And wedding photographers nowadays are kind of hurting for work so to get these in these pictures where you're know, like working with a client and you got your pencils and your pens and see where the cat hangs out it's a great way to show off the woodwork um, having hands-on materials what are the tools of the trade and so if you're wondering like I don't think I have enough material to put on social media you can use these kind of lifestyle images of you working in a space. And also you could hire somebody to just take pictures of your neighborhood. I mean, people are moving to Manhattan Beach for the neighborhood. They want to know what the shopping is like and the beach life and what the sunset looks like and the drinks. Like they're not, they could build a house anywhere in the world. They're choosing Manhattan Beach for a very specific reason. So that could be part of your social media is showing photos of the lifestyle of what it looks like to live in your neighborhood. All right, so networking. Make a list of 12 people who, are your, who could be your brand ambassadors. So a brand ambassador is somebody, and you certainly have them, who tells all of their friends about you. They're like, oh, I worked with this architect. They're amazing. You have to work with them. So who are those 12 people? Maybe you don't know them. Maybe you've heard of them. Maybe they're political people. Maybe they are the movers and shakers in your town, maybe in their industry. It could be interior designers. It could be builders. Um, identify who it is that you already have and then make a list of new people and make a point of meeting them one a month. And to make it fun, you know, maybe you need to start golfing. Maybe you need to start sailing <laughs> and meet those people. What are your ideal clients already doing that they are having fun with? I just got a great client because I play pickleball and I've been playing for two years and he, you know, was finally like, yeah, let's do a website. <laughs> so are they on the, are they doing charity for the symphony? Are they art gallery type of people? It's like, what can you get involved in that would be fun for you and would open doors for other people that you don't already know? So conclusion, let me check my time real quick. Five minutes, oh good. What's at stake here? So certainly you could continue doing business as you've been doing it. You could be you know, busy working, working, working on a project, you lift up your head and they're like, okay, I need a new client this one da, 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 and continue to do that feast or famine kind of cycle or you could slow down a little bit and say okay it's okay I this is important for my for my business because what's at stake is that grand vision for your life it's that higher quality clients more profit more joy whatever it was that's on your list like that's what's at stake if you're you know if you're trying to get from Boston to to LA, you've got a roadmap there and you can, you know, okay, I'm here, I wanna get here. These are the dots along the way, I get there. But if you're in Boston and you're like, well, I don't really know where I wanna go. I'll just take this road and I'll take this client and I'll take this weird client and I'll take 
maybe I shouldn't have taken that client. And it can veer you way off course. So what's at stake is having the business that really inspires you to serve the life that you're really looking for. Higher quality clients, more freedom, more profit. Accountability, find a partner in this group. I want you to do two things when we're finished with this. One, I want you to get that guide that I'm gonna give you that's got all the resources and how to do it. And then I want you to contact somebody who's like, hey, would, would you like to help us help me through this? And it's got steps on what to do. And it'll have an email series that'll be like, hey, did you do this this week? Did you do this this week? So your homework. First off, master planning your business. Values, niche, vision. Read this book. It's two and a half hours. No brainer. Okay. This is what you're going to do one day a week with your accountability partner until it's finished. Take a screenshot of this. Google my business, analytics, testimonials, upload photos. And on my guide, I'll show you the technical stuff on how to do this. Update your website with your master plan elements. This is messaging that speaks specifically to your ideal client and then implement a lead magnet. One day a month, write and revise one blog, blog article. Two, post them to your website, social media newsletter. Three, network with a brand ambassador. And that's it. So I've got this guide that you can download on my website. It's in the footer of every page, which is dwellingcreative.com. Um, it talks about portfolio curation, Google stuff, blogging, social media, and networking. And it'll help you through it. And if you have any questions, honestly, email me. I would be happy to help if there's any kind of gap in what you're looking for, what you're needing. Um, and let me back up here a little bit. Accountability. Okay, so if there's... If this, if you look at this and you say, oh, master planning my business, that like, that's a lot. If that feels like too much, skip that. And do this, do this Google stuff. Just do number one and then do this. Even if you don't know what kind of articles you should be writing or if you're an expert or what that field is, just start this, just start a writing practice. Or if you can't do it yourself, hire somebody to do it. Or, hire, or bring somebody on your team who can do it and just get into the practice of writing or educating and finding out what that is. And even making that link on your website, it doesn't even necessarily need to be on your menu. It can be hidden somewhere, but somewhere that Google can find it so that nine months down the road, you'd be like, oh, now I know exactly what I wanna say, then you can revise that blog, blog article and, and Google says, yeah, you've been around for nine months, you deserve it, here's your bump. Okay, and that's it. So let's see, let's open it up to questions. Thank you, Melissa, that was wonderful. I mean, really, truly wonderful. Thank I think you. you hit a great tone with being so inspirational and you know, my mind is spinning like, do I ask a practical question or do I ask a 30,000 foot question? <laughs> um, thank you for spending the time to put that together. Um, I don't see a lot of questions, but I'm just gonna kind of start off. I do wanna get to, someone asked a question, Jennifer Marapese asked a question. I think we can get to that because it kind of, it gets a little into a niche of business to business mm -hmm. and it gets into Google Analytics. But um, you touched upon this a little bit. Um, for those of us that just seem or feel completely overwhelmed by this, um, you touched upon it a little. What do you really think is the biggest starting point? Um, I appreciate the buddy system because I currently have a buddy within kind of my quote unquote marketing and it it keeps you accountable. But other than that, where do you think somebody should just start organizing themselves? You know, because we architects, we kind of want it to be perfect before we publish anything. <laughs> oh, I hear you. It took me a long time to sit down and blog also. And it, it took having somebody else do it for me to make it actually happen. So what mm -hmm. I would do is I just write out like a very rough, like da 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 da. And then I hand it off to somebody else and be like, okay. Somebody else is taking care of it for me. So there's that, but then there's also the just like writing or getting it out. Even if you're not a writer, like you've got, I have so much respect for architects and builders. 
I honestly think that the work that you guys are doing is the most leading edge combination of art and technology that's on the planet, even more so than commercial, because in a house you can have, you know, so many different materials and that connection and how to bring it all together. And then you're, you're, you're dealing with like the human, the American family, which is the unit of civilization. So the point of all that is that you guys have so much knowledge to be able to do what you're doing. You need to know geology, hydrology, dirt, soils, communication. And then on top of that, you're a business owner. So you've got such a wealth of information. The idea is to kind of brain dump it onto a page. So if you can start like a, a journal writing habit, that's very helpful where you can just start to like get it all out on the page, all the stuff that's in your mind, just get it all out. And then you can start to kind of hone it down and say, okay, this is the stuff that I really like writing about, or that I feel like I've got more knowledge about than anybody else. And then you can start to hone that down and hone it down. And uh, again, you can put up a blog post on your website without attaching it to a menu item. And it's very unlikely that people will find that because Google won't index it I mean, they'll index it, but again, they're looking for an authority. So they're not gonna send somebody to a brand new blog post right away because they're not sure if you are an authority yet. They're, they're looking for whether or not you are. So you can even post stuff and not really worry that people are gonna read it for a long time and then come back to it and revise it. And every time you revise that post, even over years, it'll instantly get a boost because Google's looking for that. They, they don't want, um, what they're trying to avoid is people who are just putting like massive amounts of content up there that don't really have any value. And as a computer algorithm without a human actually reading it, the way that they do that is saying, okay, they've come back to this post and they're revising it because they wanna make it better. If it was just like a content dump, it's not likely that somebody would be doing that. So I think just, yeah, having a journal, just sitting down and doing it and putting stuff up there, maybe revising it later would be a really great step. Let's springboard up that. Um, Rick, you actually, you have a question about the blog idea. Um, your questioning is, you know, the market already saturated. How unique do you have to be to find or target your audience? Can you unmute yourself? Maybe you want to ask the question directly to Melissa? Are you still there? Hi, uh, yes, this is Rick. Thank you. Um, I, I follow a lot of, I'm, I'm in the commercial realm, you know, in architecture in Boston, and I follow a lot of, you know, architect, you know, architect uh, publications, Dwell, um, and a lot of things in, in that realm. And I, and I think speaking to the idea of, you know, whether you're an authority or not, um, sort of plays into this as well, you know, if you're sort of new, new in the market or new to the game, you know, a lot of people can design houses and then how much of your own um, sort of, you know, person, personal ideologies you want to try to imbue in that, you know, in that blog realm. And then, you know, where do you, where do you sort of send that to market, you know, to the specific target audience? Um, and, you know, anything pertaining to that, you know, would be helpful to have uh, some, you know, discussion on. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the thing about niche is that your personality has a lot to do with that. So say somebody else does the exact same thing that you're doing, but then they approach it in an entirely different way. Maybe they're like really hands off and you're really hands on. And so the way that you are relating to customers is way different or your energy is way different. You know, the, it could be that, um, you know, you're outgoing and enthusiastic and, and so relating to other people with that same kind of energy has a lot to do with your niche also, rather than just a specific thing. So a lot of, a lot of times people will don't want to put a lot of their personal self into their, into their marketing because they don't want people to, it feels a little invasive, but what's great about doing that is you start to identify the worldview of, of, a, of a person. So for me, um, I'm a, a working mom. I love the outdoor stuff. Um, I am extroverted and I like 
community involvement. So when I see people who have those same values as I do, because they have posted that they did a, a charity event or because they went on a mountain biking ride or because they just had a big, um, you know, they came back from a great vacation with their family. Like that's, just, I'm like, oh yeah, we would totally get along. I would, I want to go to coffee with that person. I would hang out with that person. Is there they're about to go on a journey with you guys that is invested, you know, it's, they're giving you a lot of information about their personal life. And they're hoping that this is a relationship that will continue on because you've created this, this new life transformation from them. So your personality is a niche along with, with any other, you know, the style of building or whatever it is that you're doing. So you combine those two and there's nobody in the world that's doing the same thing that you can. So just being able to put down your guard a little bit and, and um, invite them into your personal world a little bit is, is really helpful. Did that answer your question or anything else specific? No, I think, and I think, I think that's great. Um, all, all of this was wonderful. Thank you so much for the insights. Yeah. There's a Kristen or Christina, do you have a specific question? I guess I have to unmute myself. I saw that um, Leonardo just put in a question in the chat. That's a great follow up to oh. what we were just talking about, asking if there's a benefit to publishing blog posts on established platforms like LinkedIn. Thank, and thank you. Of your own company's blog? So I think you should always publish it on your own website first. And the reason is because Facebook and LinkedIn, they seem like, you know, very solid companies now, but it could be that they could change what they're doing. They could, they could possibly disappear someday. They could change their whole for format. And so if you've invested all of your assets on somebody else's platform and one day they're like, oh, so, by the way, we're not doing that anymore. Like Facebook, you can't really get organic traffic on business pages anymore. Whereas when they first started doing that, that was a great way to go. But now it's like, nah, so people move to Instagram and now people are moving to LinkedIn. So um, what I like to suggest is that you, you start, your university should be your website. And then you copy it to all those other things. So yeah, definitely put it on those things and make it a standard operating procedure that, okay, this is how this is done. I write the blog, then you hand it off to your teammate who puts it on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, all of those things. So that it's not a whole bunch of time, you're just copying pasting the same thing. And I wouldn't worry about um, replicating that stuff or people seeing the same information in two different places because often people don't have enough time to do all of that. They usually pick one that they like and they'll they'll see the information there. And even if they see it somewhere else, it's reinforcing that idea because th there are statistics about marketing that they need, that people need seven to 22 contacts with your brand before they'll actually opt in or contact you. So any little thing that you can give them, whether it's just a photo or a small thing, you know, maybe they find you first from a referral, then they see your social media, then they get an email post, you know, it's a little bit here and there. And sometimes they won't even remember where they saw you all that time. But even having cross promotional is like, oh, I saw them on, on Instagram, but they're also on LinkedIn. So they've got that connection. So it's, it's like this woven basket that just creates a, a better stability for your for your brand i do want to get to um this question from jennifer mar marpezi from peterson engineering are you still on jennifer yes i'm here do you want to ask your question i know it gets into kind of google analytics and i think more importantly the business to business how this relates uh, versus business owner, I mean, architect to client or homeowner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I'm just wondering how you would adapt the process that you shared for um, a firm that works primarily business to business. Like we're not, we're, we're not um, trying to secure uh, consumers as clients. Our clients are typically um, architects or developers. And I'm sure that much of it applies, but, you know, in 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 two minutes or less, what applies, what doesn't apply, or which things should we focus most on? Yeah, 
Uh, it's the same thing really, because even if, so say you work with a, who are, who are your target clients? Are they builders or? Oh, ar architects or developers. Architects. Owners. Or yeah. Okay. So even if uh, they are architects or developers, they still, and they're maybe they're, they're still consuming this kind of information. I think there's probably designers are checking out other designers sites more than regular people are. And oftentimes on social media, um, you I'm, I'm finding that people are trying to market to other architects rather to, than to clients. And so it's already that base of people is already on those, those areas and, and they still want to know what it is like to work with you. They want to know what your process is. They want to know, um, you know, what kind of personality you have, what your values are. I mean, it, that doesn't change at all. People are people at, at the end of the day, whether or not they're a business or a homeowner. And if they're referring you to other people, they still want to know that the information that you've got on your site is useful to other people. So I think it's definitely uh, relevant to, to all areas. Does that answer your question or you want to be more specific? No, that, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kristen, I think you have a question here about typologies. Um, yes, my question is um, in crafting your niche for your website and for that initial message that sort of grabs people. Um, for those of us who work in more than one typology, residential and commercial or beyond that, um, how can we craft a niche that isn't typology based? Right. Um, well, it could certainly be more about your values. So it could be, um, so the, the landscape architect that I worked with in Oakland, he, his landscapes start at a, a million dollars and um, he did every kind of design under the sun, you know, whatever that person was interested in, he would do it. And so his theme overall was quality. So he would never recommend doing, like his big thing was, if anyone talked about doing um, using concrete and making it look like something else, like making concrete look like stone or making concrete look like bricks, he was like, we need to be honest with our materials. <laughs> like concrete is concrete. <laughs> Why try to make it look like something else? So he wanted quality. And so that was like his big thing. And the other thing that he was so good at was he really wanted to know about his clients, like what they did, what their hobbies were. And they, you know, often were, were world travelers and he would put that, you know, tuck that information away. And then he would bring a surprise into the design that had to do with some kind of little Italian town that they went to. And so he had this knack of, of one being quality and that um, being very personal about what it was so that he could deliver something that was so delightful and surprising at the end and in, in the process too that they were like how does he know he's like a fortune teller you know it's like he's such a, a spirit that he wants to provide this absolute quality product for people so yeah it doesn't have to be a certain type but just like the way that you work with people and how do you um, I mean, testimonials would be great for that. You know, go through your whole list of contacts and they don't necessarily need to be just clients. They could be subcontractors. They could even be friends. They could be peers. Uh, go through your whole list. And, and then when they send you those, and especially people you know who write well and you know would give you just like really fabulous stuff. And most people don't mind if you edit them a little bit. Um, I mean, not the, 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 the actual content but like how it's said you know just linking things together again so testimonials i think would really show that kind of work for you if if that's what you're looking for is like that that um quality client has this to say about you and that's your overarching niche is that you know it's the client work does that make sense yeah that's great thank you yeah and as far as the testimonials go um i would I mean, it's great to have a lot of reviews on Google because I mean, not just for people to see that, but Google says, oh, they've got 12, they have, it's just a computer algorithm really. So they're looking at how many testimonials you have. And so they bump you up if you have a bunch. 
So I would go, I would send it out to your subcontractors first, you know, and then um, some of your peers and then save the ones that you, you know, are going to be like really outstanding testimonials for the last so that they're kind of up at the top. And then you can take, so have them do it on Google, Google because they have to do it there. You send them that link. And then from there, you copy it to your website. You can use that in your social media and you could spread it all over the place. And then they only have to do it in one place. And it's also nice to have some on house as well. If you found that that's a really good business space for you, um, you could split them into a couple different places because that will also show up. Um, like Facebook reviews will also show up on that side margin. Um, Ellen Tunison Kulus had a comment, but I'm wondering if there's a question in there, Ellen, that we could put in front of uh, Melissa about being a former client yourself. No, 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 no. I, I, did have, I didn't have a question. I was just, um, I now work for the architect firm that was my architect. Um, <laughs> but what I realize now, and I'm now talking to potential clients, existing clients, and the architects talk about their phases and oh yeah, and coordination, so many hours of coordination. And when I was a client, I was always thinking, what are they coordinating? So uh, we always try to give with our invoices um, now, um, because uh, I was part of that to, to, um, to advise that, to tell more what you've been doing and why you have eight hours of coordination a la for this amount per hour. And it really helps to, although the client of course sees it, but we the architects do so much behind the scenes, which for you as architects is logical because that's part of your work. And that is, but for a client that is not always logical. And I really try, what I was trying to say is try to imagine being the client and sending that invoice with all these hours and you think, whoa, don't, what, why is this invoice that's this high? So try to, um, that's what I would advise for existing clients because that in the end will create a good relationship. And as um, Melissa said so clearly, a referral is the best you can get to start with. So. It also, it also it helps with your existing clients to get that referral if you feel you have an honest communication. Of course, there are moments that you think, oh my God, uh, that's with every client. And there are always things that go wrong and they're more expensive. But it's all about imagining being the client yourself to explain, in my case, I do uh, all the invoicing also for the office, to why, why we invoice these hours, what these hours are. And some clients just accept that and they write the check. But there are also clients that, that yeah, for, for good reason, are more critical. And, and you can be ahead of that game by, for example, if you send the invoice, um, do it in, in a small message, write a little story. I write the story, what has happened this week from a client, from a business manager point of view. So it's not the architects that write the story, I write it, which makes it more um, closer to the client because I think more as a client than as an architect. I'm not an architect, so I work with architects, but I'm not an architect. So that was just my little thing, which I thought would fit in very well in whole marketing and, and your referral. Um, and by the way, great presentation, but that's what was my two cents, which I wanted to add here. Uh, a good Thank point there is um, speaking the language of the client um, because if you're using wording on your website that your clients don't understand, it's likely that Google is not giving the, the right search results either because um, often architects will use jargon that, that real people don't actually use. And so if they're searching for something and on your website, it says one thing, but they don't even know what that is, then how are they gonna find it? So trying to figure out interviewing your clients about exactly what words they, they are associating with the kind of words work that you do is important. And then Google will also do that. So you can use that Google Trends website to find out, okay, are people actually using these specific words or is this architect jargon? There's also a question I was reading here um, about public space oriented architect and ideal clients, meaning those are clients that have money. And I don't think that's necessarily true. I don't know if James Carr is still on here, but I'd like to address that question. Um, so my first job as a landscape architect was designing streetscapes for, um, in Oakland. And often the city 
I mean, their end client really is the individual, even though they're the ones paying the bills, they want to create a space where individuals are going to um, have an experience that, you know, is better for Oakland in the long run. And so really that the end client is an individual in the same way. So showing lifestyle pictures where a family is in a public space, having a great time has the same effect on a city who's spending money on architectural works as it does for, for an individual. And, and as far as clients with money, ideal clients having um, money, I, that depends on your values, really, because if you value having an incredible, having a client who's really excited about the process and just like enamored with the kind of work that you do and who you are, if your value is um, connection with people more than money, then that is an ideal client for you. So it really depends on what your values are. Or if there's a client who really is passionate about sustainability and maybe they don't have the money to do everything that they want but they they believe wholeheartedly in what you do and they can be a spokesperson for you for other people who may have more money to to get that like the enthusiasm of a client I think um, can can supersede money for sure if that's what your values are is James Carr is he still on Maybe not, but maybe not. I, I couldn't find that question. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Uh, thank you, Ellen. We love two cents worth. <laughs> we love uh, that insight. Um, Chris Chu, you had a question about a uh, website platform. You know, Melissa, what are you finding to be the most effective website platforms to work with? You must kind of work with an array. Uh, what's your kind of top three or what should we be looking for as architects, you know, sure. to meet our industry needs? So I mostly only work in WordPress. Um, and then the other one I would recommend is Squarespace. So the advantage of WordPress is that there are a lot more people who know WordPress. So if you want, if you needed to bring in help and have other people working on your work on your site, um, there are so many people who know WordPress. It's, I think maybe, I can't, can't remember the exact numbers, but I think it's somewhere like 40% of websites on the on the web are WordPress. And Squarespace is much smaller, but it's user friendly. Um, they've got really beautiful templates. The downsides of Squarespace is you don't have as much ability to customize it. So they give you a template, like so. For example, for a homepage, they've got one template, and you're not really able to put in dynamic elements that are different unless you switch the whole template. So it does have some restrictions in that way. Um, that I, which is why I like WordPress better. Okay, that's good to know. Um, so I have a very old website from ten years ago, and I've done many great projects since then. And the guy that did it for me 10 years ago, he says that platform no longer, he cannot even work with it anymore. So I would have to start from scratch. And I have lots of great content for it. I just, you know, as you say, we're so busy doing the projects that we have, stepping aside to look at, oh my God, I've accomplished so much. And yet there's no place that anybody can really see it. So I'm inspired now to do something about it. But I, it's like, well, I don't even know to even get a current website done. I don't even know where to start. So um, so, okay, so um, is Squarespace something that I could do myself, you think, or better leave it to the professionals or a WordPress, leave it to the professionals? Yeah. Um, you know, you could go either way and maybe use your past as an example. Like when, when you were working on this kind of stuff on your own in the past, did you enjoy it? Was it fun? Like for my business, I always delegate the stuff that I don't like doing. <laughs> because no, I just... Yeah, I didn't do anything on the web. I just gave okay. them pictures. But um, I have lots of great material for my web page. Um, what I found, uh, actually, I've done a lot of social media, especially Instagram, okay. and also Nextdoor. I don't know if you, everybody has Nextdoor, this Nextdoor Newton, Nextdoor whatever. People are finding me through Nextdoor, mm -hmm. such and such, because clients, people looking for an architect, and my, I'll tell my clients, write in something about me. And so people are finding me through that. But I'm finding that I'm getting a lot of low quality 
people, I mean, clients that don't really match what I do just because, you know, anyway, so I'm trying to filter out those kind of leads and try, what you said at the beginning really uh, hits home with me because I want high quality clients, but actually I have so many referrals from current clients and past clients, maybe that's not such an issue, but I'm finding that there's some like lesser you know, projects that are coming to me, but I, yet I have to maintain a good image. I have to respond and talk to them for 45 minutes and then go, I'm sorry, this is not a good fit, you know? Right. So anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think you, I, I would say most architects have all the skills they need to do Squarespace. So if you were excited okay. about starting it, I would say go for it. And then as far as pre-qualifying, absolutely like put on your contact form, like questions that you know will weed ah, those people yes, out. Yes so that you yep. don't even have to contact them. They know that they're not qualified to work with you. It's like, like bringing a staff member onto your team that ha doesn't have the education you need. Like, why would you bring on a client that hasn't read through your resources? They're not, they're not educated enough to be your client. So make sure your, your, your system on your website makes them go through that educational process before they can get to you. Okay. Good idea. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I wonder if, um, I would love to know what was most helpful for everyone about the presentation so that I can you know, make it better for the next time. If, if anyone can just type in a small thing, that would be really great for me. Yeah, and we can save this to save the chat. Um, so you have the full list of questions. I'm wondering, Melissa, what you tell, so I, you know, when I was a young, Buck, you know, working for an architecture firm and we were trying to promote, you know, let's get a website. It's our calling card. There's a legitimacy, you know, all that kind of stuff. What do you have to say to people who realize there's a need for some sort of presence in social media, but they kind of like to be a little more discreet, fly under the radar, mm -hmm. uh, you know, their clientele is really, um, you know, doesn't want to be out there, you know, with tons of photographs and things like that. How do you kind of reconcile, like, we kind of have to do this because this is where we're going. This is where we are, actually. And those clients that are like, yeah, I'm not, you know, jumping in the pool yet completely. Right. Well, I think the educational platform with blogging probably is um, a really good fit for that because it feels more academic. It's not quite as showy. Uh, and of course it's great for SEO. So again, you're educating, so, you know, it's think of it more of a, like a library and a university than in as sales. And even if you're not a writer, if you can team up with somebody who is, uh, there's Upwork is a, upwork.com is a place where you guys can find people who do stuff. And if you, I always, the best people I've found on there, I go to the highest pri price point and I don't mess around with people who are in the lower price point because I want people to really be the best of what I pull from there. So I found some writers on there. It does take some time to find the right people, but uh, I think that can be, can be a good spot. And really, Daniel, um, the tone of your writing that you put out there sets the scene. You know, it can, it, it should be really, close to what it is that you, the vibe that you're looking for. You're trying to connect with people who have that same kind of vibe. And so they'll recognize that in your writing and in carefully chosen images. Does that sound like a no, good? No, but yeah, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. We're reaching the 130 point. Um, do you have any closing comments, Melissa? Um, I would say, you know, probably the most important thing for any business owner is to really have that accountability. And for me, I love taking courses and getting that information. But once I have the course, I'll be like, ah, that's a lot of work to get to it. So for me, I know that I need an actual human. <laughs> <laughs> and so I have invested a lot in coaching, guilty, guilty. <laughs> <laughs> in coaching programs where a lot of what they just do is, Hey, did you see, did you see, did you do what you said you were going to do? <laughs> so find okay. that accountability partner. Uh, download this guide, dwellingcreative.com. You can find it in the footer of every page and it will help you with the technical aspects. Then get with your accountability partner and make a plan. You know, hopefully 
if you have, if you don't have a lot of this stuff set up, if you can set aside one day a week for a while until you get caught up. And then when you're caught up, then dedicate that one day. And, and I, I think those um, brand ambassadors is such a key to like, get out of your comfort zone, like go after somebody like kind of famous or kind of like that scares you a little bit, you know, put that on your list and see if you can get a meeting with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of us come back from those meetings alive. So that's a good sign. <laughs> no, you know, nothing's, like, nothing's killed us yet, right? <laughs> if they say no, that gives you courage to do it again. You know, it's just this like repetition. Yeah. Well, as small business owners, uh, if we're not used to no, uh, we have to get a tougher skin a little bit, right? So um, thank you very much. This is very uh, insightful. Again, this recording is going to be on the RDC website. Um, I don't know the specifics how to access it, but I can find out. Um, I would think the same for the small practices um, web, uh, web page as well. Um, Christina and Kristen, do you have any final comments? Um, I just want to say, you know, everyone stay healthy, stay sane during this time, connect with people, um, and maintain, <laughs> maintain your mental health, really. Um, but it's great to see so many of you, so many new faces, and I suspect that's because we're merging with a new um, committee that I'm seeing a lot of names here that I've never seen before. But anyway, Kristen and Christina, do you have any final comments? No, particularly. I just wanted to say thank you and um, thanks for reaching out, Daniel, to collaborate on this. And um, Melissa, that was absolutely phenomenal. I am completely inspired. <laughs> I've been, I've run. been, I've been putting aside every time. I have a marker in my calendar that comes up every week that says marketing, and I just sort of whoop, put it aside. <laughs> but now I'm, I'm really truly inspiring, and it was great. Yeah. Thank you. That's my Pilates reminder. I cancel yeah. that when it pops up. <laughs> anyway, thanks everyone for joining us. Melissa, uh, we'll touch base after if there are any questions and um, have a great day. We're almost to the end of the week. It's a beautiful fall day here in Boston, everyone. So maybe get outside and enjoy some color and the warmth. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank thanks you. Everyone.